the story of two princes, one handsome and ambitious, the other unsure of himself yet much beloved. See, the king was getting old and everyone sadly acknowledged the fact he didn't have much time left on earth. So the first prince, Adon Adoniyahu, decided to make a move for the throne. Now, maybe if there had only been one other brother, the first prince may not have been in such a rush, but there were lots of other brothers and um, the intrigue between them had been plentiful. So the oldest and the first choice to take the throne was a prince whose name ironically meant faithful and it was awful because the one thing that he ended up being known for was his stalker-like lust for his half-sister and the trickery and treachery that he resorted to in order to first have his way with her and then abandon her. So Prince Faithful ended up losing his chance at the throne when his brother, whose name meant Father of Peace, avenged his sister. Now, Father of Peace guy was the next oldest, and by avenging his sister, he'd also cleared his own path to the throne, but he couldn't stand the weight, and encouraged by the support of the nation, he launched a popular rebellion, which did land him uh, the throne for a very short time, but unfortunately for him, he was handsome, uh, but not so wise. And the Father of Peace decided to raise an army against his own father, the true king, and he died in the battle. Now, this left the third in line, brother Kiliab, whose name meant perfection of the father, but sadly for him, his fate is lost to history. Which brings up Prince Adoniyahu. Now, as monarchies go, one would assume that with him being the oldest, he would have to just wait. Uh, but one of his younger brothers, a prince whose name meant friend of God, seemed to have something that drew the hearts of the people to him. And Prince Adoniyahu decided he needed to strike early. So he told his friends that in his opinion, he should be king already. And apparently enough of them agreed that as they talked more and more, they got themselves all worked up. And instead of speculating that he should be king, he said to himself, I will be king. And so after coming to this decision, uh, the prince got together chariots and horses as well as 50 men to run in front of him. And so while Prince Adoniyahu began building up his own royal guard, he also started cautiously bringing up his ideas with some of the palace elite, which were allies that he'd need if he was truly going to pull this off. Now, one of the first people he talked to was the army commander who had killed his own brother in the last uprising. His name was Yoab, and he proved to be a sympathetic and willing ally, and so encouraged, the prince continued his recruiting mission. So next, he talked to a priest, but not just any priest. This was a man who had been co-high priest, assisting and counseling the king often. But this was also a man who'd fallen out of favor with the king and who was demoted from being the high priest because the Holy Spirit had left him. And I think that's probably why this prince recruited him. He probably felt betrayed and felt as though he had a score to settle with the king. However, not every palace elite felt good with the prince's plan. Uh, notably Zadok, the high priest, who was a descendant of Aaron's priestly line and a powerful opponent of paganism in the land. There was also Benaiah, a man whose name matched his work. His Yahweh Delivers was his name, and he was truly one of the greatest warriors in the king's army. One of the famed mighty men, a man who faced an Egyptian giant with just a club, and he won, and he too refused to join the cause. Now, as the plans moved forward, the ambitious prince organized a ceremony, which consisted of sacrifices and a supper, all to occur in a place known as the king's paradise. In other words, Prince Adonayahu had planned for himself a coronation ceremony. And to the ceremony, he invited all the men of Judah who were royal officials and all the king's sons and all his brothers, except one. Uh, and that one other prince, Prince Shlomo, was one who was much loved by the people. His invitation never came. And for that matter, neither did the prophet Natanz or Benaiah's or really any of the king's special guard. And according to ancient Jewish customs, this meant that Prince Adonayahu was well aware of what he was doing, usurping the throne from his brother. Now, one of those uninvited men, Natan, he somehow caught wind of this ceremony and he quickly told Prince Shlomo's mother, Bathsheba, and immediately realizing that this uprising would mean her death and his, they went to talk with the king himself and explained the situation and they moved quickly. They gathered all the armed men from the palace and put Prince Shlomo onto the king's mule. And the prince, along with the armed men, Benaiah and Natan the prophet, they marched all over Israel shouting, Long live King Shlomo! And blowing trumpets so that all the people knew that this was by the order of the true king. And <laughs> the people knew this. 
and they loved it. And everywhere they were cheering uh, and their city resounded with dancing and music. And the historian Josephus said they made music till both the earth and the air echoed with the multitude of the instruments of music. Now immediately when they returned, the king appointed Shlomo the ruler of Israel and, and Judah, and he surrendered his own throne to his son. Now Prince Adonayahu, he was alerted to these proceedings when he and all his guests began to hear the massive commotion outside. Uh, People didn't know what to think, but the commander was very unhappy and on edge. And although there was a delicious feast being served, nobody really ate much because they were too uneasy about the noise from outside. But before long, the priest's son, Jonathan, came running to the feasting area. And when Prince Adonayahu saw him, thinking he had good news, he was glad. It's not good news, said Jonathan. The old king has made Shlomo the new king. That is the noise that you hear. And at that, all of the guests got up and began to flee. But for Prince Adonayahu, simply running away was not going to be good enough. Immediately, he knew where he had to go. He ran as fast as he could to the altar, and he grabbed a hold of its horns. And when the guards found him, he begged to see his brother so he could plead for his life. When the new king heard what his brother had asked, he said, If he proves himself to be a worthy man, not a hair of his head will fall to the ground. But if evil is found in him, he will die. Well, sadly, Prince Adonayahu, or Adonijah, as you may better know him, proved not to be worthy, but instead to be opportunistic and cunning. And soon, he tried to marry his father David's youngest wife, Abishag. And it was a way of uh, establishing his legitimacy to taking the throne for himself. And that was one move too far. And finally, tragically, his brother King Solomon put an end to his con. Now, I have a few quick observations from this, and then I'll finish. The first one is that the whole thing could have been avoided if Prince Adonijah had just gotten better advisors. There's a sage piece of advice in the book of Proverbs 13 that says, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools suffers harm. And this reminds me of all too many times in my own life when questionable choices have been made. I think for most of my life, I've been pretty good about choosing my friends, but nevertheless, every now and then, a, a, a fool managed to slip into my circle, probably attracted by all that we had in common. Um, I can remember one time as a little kid, I was over at my best friend's house out in the country, and he told me that a bear had walked through his yard earlier that morning. Now, if either of us had been a wise man, we would have thought this was a good story and then proceeded to play inside. Uh, unfortunately, neither one of us in those days could have been accused of being wise men, and instead of playing inside, we each got a big stick and started down the trail toward where the bear disappeared. Now, thankfully, the good Lord was watching over us, and we came to our senses and turned around when we stepped on an underground beehive and released the rage of a thousand honeybees. Now, quickly coming to our senses, we both ran back up the forest trail to the house, screaming at the top of our lungs, and when we got back to his house, his mother quickly ran a bath and dunked us both to get the remaining bees out of our thick uh, mullets. <laughs> um, I will never forget the sight of all those dead bees floating on the water. You know, the next thing we know, we're thrown into his mom's little minivan and we're sped the 30 minutes into town being told for the first time in our lives to scream the whole way so that she'd know we were alive. And as we neared town, we were pulled over by the police. Suddenly, we were ordered to stop screaming as his mom tried to calmly explain why children that were, and also were not hers, uh, were all screaming in the back of a speeding van. Uh, the officer thankfully understood and escorted us with lights flashing all the way to the walking clinic where my mom met us. Now, they had to use meat tenderizer from the nearby grocery store to get the dozens of stingers out of our heads. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools suffers harm. Ask yourself the question sometime, am I a companion of fools? Now, my second observation is this, Adonijah didn't guard his heart. Once again, the book of Proverbs uh, shed some light on this. It says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. I mean, I can't stress this enough. What we think about becomes what we obsess about. What we obsess about becomes what we fixate on. And if we're not helped by a power greater and outside of us, what we fixate on is what we will find a way and a justification to do. 
See, the reality of an unguarded heart is both serious and tragic. A little loneliness unchecked can turn into lust, which unchecked can turn into inappropriate comments, which unchecked can turn into a full-blown affair and shattered relationship. Guard your heart. A little self-pity unchecked can turn into a martyr complex, which unchecked can turn into undermining gossip, which unchecked can turn into a, a workplace coup d'etat, bringing with it unemployed parents, ruined friendships, and a broken community. Guard your heart. See, Adonijah got the idea in his head that he shouldn't have to wait until his father died to be king. This he left unchecked, and it turned into conversations with his friends who convinced him it was his right and the time was upon him, and he left that unchecked, and it grew into conspiracy among the palace elites and preparations for war and an attempted usurping of the throne, which in the end cost him his life. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. And my final observation is from near the end of this story. It's the part where Adonijah realizes he's been foiled. His guests have gone. He has run to the altar to grab the horns and beg for his life. His brother, friend of God, offers him grace. He says, if he proves himself a worthy man, not a hair of his head will be harmed. But if evil is found in him, he will die. Now that's a good deal. But you've been given a far better one. See, your gig is up too. You've been caught by your own snares, entangled by your own ambition, and you've realized your only hope is to cling to the altar of sacrifice and beg. And, and we know the sacrifices altered on this altar, offered on this altar represent the cleansing of the Israelite sins, uh, the wiping clean of their slates, and ours can be cleaned as well. See, although God wants you to live a good life and to be as representative to others, he doesn't hold it against you when you blow it. Adonijah was given the option to prove himself worthy or to die. Somebody already died for you. So if you fail once, twice, or a thousand times, it doesn't matter. Your debt is already paid. Romans 3 says, For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as an appeasement by His blood, through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his patient tolerance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. See, God offers to pass over your sins and give you today and every day a chance to live worthily. He wants to be both just and your justifier. You can have this peace today, this peace of living as God's new man, as God's new woman. You can start fresh again. Paul says in Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 7, he says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you, live a life worthy of the calling that you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There's one body and one spirit, just as you are called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each of us, grace has been given as Christ bestowed it. Let's take that grace today.